It is Q&A Sunday. We do this every single year, the first Sunday of every year. We are a Jesus-centered, spirit-led church. In other words, it's a fancy, word, a fancy way of saying a word and spirit church. We hold high the truth of God. We go through every Sunday either a theme or we go through a book of the Bible. But we always want to kick off with truth being at the forefront. So it was motivated, these Q&As, by just wondering, hey, what are y'all asking? Knowing that as we march through the Bible, we won't address every single issue. And you guys responded. You sent us tons of questions. We want to say thank you. And we're going to take the next 40 to 60 minutes to answer those questions. So if you can give an applause, we're going to have the two pastors, Justin and Glenn, come up here. They're going to go ahead. Give it up for them. They prepared for this. And you guys have sent in the question. So we're a church that just wants to be Berean-like and give responsible biblical answers to everything that you're saying. I'm going to end up facilitating these questions. All of these questions were sent by y'all. None of these have came from us. So these are to answer what, is, what you guys are talking about around the table. With that being said, we want to connect with God, pray for his truth to go forward, and then I'm going to end up facilitating discussion. Sound good, church? Jesus, we thank you so much that you're in the embodiment of truth. God, you're in the embodiment of grace. And would those two things go forward today? God, we thank you for a new year, 2023. And we are grateful, God, that restoration and also moving forward, killing sin, and also having a delight in you all comes from you. We're grateful for new life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So first question from the congregation for 2023, Q&A. Justin, is the gift of languages, also known as tongues, as important as the gospel? Yeah, uh, great question. I would say start, starting right off, uh, absolutely not. I think we need to clarify here. I want to go straight to scripture to answer this question. I really appreciate this question um, because I think what I'm hearing underlying this question is because we have mentioned, we've even given um, a one-off sermon about speaking in languages, um, that you may think, okay, is this of highest importance? And I would go straight to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, one through four, and say, absolutely not. Paul, in his own words in Scripture, says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And here it is. For I delivered to you as of first importance, of first importance, what I also received. This is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So right away, scripture always confirms scripture, and it shows us truth that the gospel is of first importance. Because in this context, we know that the book of 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 up to this point have only been addressing spiritual gifts. They've been talking about the different speaking in languages, prophecy, things of that nature, um, how to do them in love and in order. And yet 15, Paul says, okay, now that that's all out of the way of first importance, remember the gospel that I've preached to you. So we see that very clearly. I don't want to diminish, though, at the same time in the same breath, um, that speaking language isn't a gift. We know that the gospel is an event. It is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that brings forgiveness and reconciliation back to God in right relationship. And yet through that, we're told in Ephesians 1 that we have now all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms through Christ, through the gospel. And one of the spiritual blessings is spiritual gifts and specifically addressing speaking in languages, one of the most beautiful gifts that we see here, um, along with all the other beautiful gifts. Uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, the purpose of speaking in languages. It says, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, understands him but he utters mysteries in the spirit. Uh, meaning that the beautiful thing about the gospel is it brings us back into a relationship, friendship, partnership with God, and that's all that speaking in languages does. It may not be for corporate, it may not be in public if there's no interpreter, um, but it is a beautiful prayer language where we still get to speak to God. That's good. That's good. Second question that we have here, Glenn, if you wouldn't mind fielding this. How do you explain that Jesus is God himself and the Son of God? So, 
first of all, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, great question. Here's why that's a really good question. I think we were talking, um, there was a report that came out that was called the State of Theology. And it was a survey that was done um, kind of testing people's general understanding of uh, central biblical truth. What do we know about God? What do we know about man? What do we know about Jesus and what he accomplished? And um, it was really, really bad in the United States. So we're, as we're heading into 2023, I feel like one of the things that the church, like the big C church, should have as a resolution is let's make sure we are teaching the word of God. Let's make sure we're informing, edifying, equipping people to understand theology, which is the study of God. So that question, how do you explain that Jesus is God himself and the son of God? Paramount importance because it sets the Christian faith apart from every other world religion. This question, I think, revolves around the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, You're not going to find the word Trinity in Scripture, but it teaches across all of the Bible that there is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see this from Genesis to Revelation. I'll say it again. One God, three persons. And I want to zoom in on one thing in particular to answer this question, and it's this. Jesus is not God's Son in the way that we might recognize human father and son. God didn't produce a son with Mary as his wife. Um, He didn't have a son in that sense. Instead, Jesus has always been God the Son, and he became human. Mary conceived him by the power of God the Spirit, as we learn in the Gospel of Luke. And sometimes it's just helpful for questions like this to take a survey of Scripture. What do verses tell us? So I want to look at the Gospel of John, chapter 1, first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. This is speaking of Jesus. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Just a handful of verses down from that, John 1, 14. Some of you were here as we preached through this as a church when we first launched a couple years ago. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus says, his words, I and the Father are one. And then in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus says, he's praying that they may all be, speaking of the disciples, one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Church, really, really important note. In all these things, Jesus is not saying that he and the Father are the same. He doesn't say that he is the Father. He says they are one. They are distinct, yet unified. So because God is triune, that's the word that we use to describe God as a trinity, we can, this is really cool, we can simultaneously say, try to wrap your mind around this, that God sent his Son into the world And that God came into the world. (laughs) That's amazing. We can say at the same time, God sent his son into the world and that God himself came into the world. We can use language that we see from the Apostle Paul in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 13. He says, we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I would say to whoever submitted this question, a, a study of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, would be so, super helpful. And I have a recommended resource. It's a book I love. I would recommend it to anybody. Um, it's a book that's called Delighting in the Trinity. Delighting in the Trinity. Uh, we will, I haven't talked to Kevin about this, but I'm sure we can make this happen. We can link any recommended resources that, that we are making here uh, in our YouTube video description. It's by Michael Reeves, and and the subtitle of it is An Introduction to the Christian Faith. So I would contend if you don't have a good understanding of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's a wonderful place to start and and develop in your Christian faith. That's good. That's good, Glenn. Justin, if you wouldn't mind mind fielding this next question, how can a prophecy be false? 
Yeah, great question. Um, I think underlying, I, I hear, um, after I had preached the sermon on prophecy, addressing kind of Acts um, 2 with Agabus and all that, um, kind of what is prophecy? I think I just want to start off with that. So a biblical definition, um, we can see where it actually comes from. Second Peter 1.21 says that for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So no true prophecy uh, is of man. It is from God to man for man to then speak to other people. Um, so by that definition, uh, none of us here are calling God a liar. So we would say that no true biblical prophecy could ever be false. So I just want to start off there. I also kind of want to address maybe the nuance there with Acts 2, something that I wish I could um, have nuanced better maybe in that sermon in the Church After God's Own Heart series um, with Agabus, is if we look at that and how he gets this, we talked about the three kind of fold parts of a prophecy. We talk about the uh, revelation, the interpretation, application. And I want to just clarify, Agabus was not wrong in his revelation from God. He was spot on in the sense that it happened as God said it would. He would be handed over um, from the Jews to the Gentiles with the Romans. It happened like that, but it may not have happened exactly in the way that maybe Agabus and the group of Christians may have thought it would have, right? We actually see that the Romans rescue Paul out of the hands rather than torture him, right? So it's actually in the sense where it happened as God revealed in his revelation, and yet as we see the group of people and even potentially Agabus, their application and interpretation was, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem, which would have been off because Paul with the same spirit said, no, I am to go to Jerusalem. So God was not wrong. The prophecy was not wrong. Their application was wrong. And that's what I wanted to kind of nuance in that threefold part of the prophecy there. Um, with that being said, um, I think the best way to experience prophecy is just to actually experience it, right? It's not just to hear about it in a sermon, but to actually invite you to the waiting room. That is something that we do every couple months where we just wait on the Lord. The, the format of that is we pray through the scriptures. Uh, this is not just some airy experience of God that words come out of thin air. It is waiting on the Lord first by going to his word knowing that that is where the complete and full revelation of God's will and purpose, everything we need to know in life and godliness is found. And as we warm ourselves up to the voice of God through Scripture, uh, we know that anything we get then waiting on words, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophetic words, um, are going to make sure they are aligned with said Scripture. So that being said, we have stories of plenty of that things, of those things happening. Uh, Amy Casamano had shared her story about we got to pray for her and uh, got revelation that her dad had Alzheimer's and that she was missing him and Jesus was with him and has continued to walk alongside her and her family. Um, beautiful stories like that. We had other stories where people were convicted of sin, where it wasn't exposing, but it was revealing and it led to repentance and faith in Jesus. And so we want to give God glory through this. It doesn't misalign with scripture. In fact, it only confirms the very scripture that we see tells us in 1 Corinthians 14. It says, eagerly pursue and desire the spiritual gifts. So it's scripture that tells us to actually pursue prophecy, um, which cannot be false if it's truly of God. Uh, the last note I want to make about that is that um, with the revelation, right, we can talk about how a true revelation from God is always true, and yet there are times where we may think it was a revelation from God, and it's not. There have been times personally where I know I was just getting kind of cute with it, and I know that it was more my mind than God's, and that's where I'd say, okay, the revelation was actually from Justin Larson's mind, not from God's, and therefore it was false. But anytime I'm spot on with God's voice, we know it's true. And I think just a practical example um, to know how to discern that, obviously test, hold fast to what is said in Scripture and reject anything else. But also, um, I would basically say, and I get this from other theologians, there's a saying that um, the greater the clarity, the greater the accountability. Meaning that, uh, again, if it's revealed in Scripture, um, you're going to be held that much more accountable to make sure it aligns with it, or if it doesn't, vice versa. And also, just the way God reveals. Um, you'll, I think, kind of just know and get familiar with God's voice as you pursue the spiritual gifts. Uh, if God's kind of shaking you awake at one in the morning to pray for someone specifically, um, and you hear an audible voice from heaven, I think you'll know pretty well that that's probably from God. Um, if you're just driving along and you had a, maybe a flippant thought about praying for someone, who knows? Test it, right? So that's what I would say for discernment. That's good. I'll uh, 
give a little clarifying thing. So it was focused on how do you miss prophecy. So the way that we understand prophecy is made up through three things. The what, which was the word revelation. You can miss in terms of thinking, oh, that was from God when it wasn't. The what then do I do with it? Or what does it mean? And then what do I do with it now? So a lot of times we've worked through, you have to go back and listen to the teaching. We can miss it in varying ways. And that pretty much kind of answers how do you miss it? The reason that as a church, we continue to pursue all of the gifts is because they build up the church in our inner woman or inner man. So being in that room, that waiting room the last couple of times is very supernaturally natural um, from experience. So some people will see something. They will see like a valley and they'll see hills around it. That would be the what. For me, um, I didn't hear anything in the waiting room number one and then we did the waiting room number two and all I had was a word that popped in my mind and it sounded just like my regular thought life. And so I just said, okay, God, if this is from you, just bring it back again. It did. It was just one word that you would just randomly say that has to do with someone's mood. I said it, and then what do you know, three people ended up crying. Again, that just means God speaks to you in very ordinary ways. The big thing we want to train the church in is are we discerning and giving credit to God when he's speaking to us? To make it very simple, one of the things that I go with a lot in terms of discerning God's voice is, is it selfless? Is it promoting, willing others good? That usually, that always is of the Holy Spirit, not of the flesh. And then prophecy is a different manner in which we just talked about. Glenn, question for you. How do Christians respond to those who say that happiness justifies sinful lifestyles? Yeah, let me say that again, just so y'all can hear it. How do Christians respond to those who say that happiness justifies sinful lifestyles, sinful behaviors? So as I considered this question, the first thing that I wanted to emphasize to our church, City Light, God wants you to be happy. (laughs) God wants you to be happy. Um, I'm not sure where we got off in that over the years where that was kind of became wrong to, to say that. It seems to me that underneath this question is the popular notion that God's will for us is holiness, not happiness, that those have to be mutually exclusive things. And can we please dispel this? Um, I, I want to I wanna reframe it biblically. God wants you to be happy, but here's the catch. As the maker of all things, he created and designed and defined the pathway to happiness. He knows how to get there. And the way to get there is holiness. That's his will for our lives. So in other words, happiness can never be found apart from God. That's our conviction as believers. Uh, So let me expound. The key word in this question, I think, is the word sinful. Sinful lifestyles, sinful behaviors. We need to understand as a church the doctrine of sin. Uh, We have to understand what was introduced in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. In a nutshell, the first humans, Adam and Eve, God created, they were really happy. (laughs) They They were perfectly blessed, which is the word that scripture uses to describe happiness, blessing. If you're blessed, you are happy. And that's because, I mean, the big reason is because they had fellowship and relationship with God in its fullness. Um, There's nothing that compares to to that. So when they disobeyed God, they lost relationship with him. And that's one of the most devastating effects of sin in our world is the soul's separation from God. Um, Scripture says that sin, and this is really brief, you could go into a lot more here, but it says that sin darkens our hearts, it clouds our understanding, it kills our soul, it destroys us from the inside out. With sin and the curse of sin in our world come a lot of really horrific baggage. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. In the epistle to the Romans, Paul says that we are slaves of sin. 
we're, we're in bondage from birth to sin. Uh, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. Death is the greatest enemy at the end of the day. Um, 1 Timothy 4.2 says that to be in sin is to have your conscience seared. It's to not be able to think straight. It's to not be able to have the, the full presence of mind and to be sober-minded. Um, I think elsewhere in Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about the futility, the foolishness of our minds. Um, I love the story in Numbers. Basically, the people of Israel are um, not being obedient to God because he had asked a part of the group to go and aid another part of the group on the west side of the land, and they wanted to set up and camp on the east side. Really simple. But here's what, here's what Moses says that I think we can all relate to. He says, you will, but if you will not do so, talking about God's command, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And here's the words, be sure your sin will find you out. So here's what I want to say. This is a phrase that's really helpful to me. I'm nuancing it a little bit for the way I would answer this question. Sin always promises more happiness than it can actually give. And it always costs you more happiness than you think it will. And because it doesn't satisfy with true happiness, speaking of sin and walking in the flesh, what it does is it baits us into a, an unending cycle where we, we continue to not be fed. And so our practice of sin increases. The intensity of our practice of sin increases because we are looking for happiness in the wrong places. And we don't find it. Many of us look at our stories and we think, yes, that's, I've experienced that in my life. The increasing intensity and bait of sin that does not leave me where I thought that it would. Here's the really good news of the message of Christianity. Is that through repentance and faith, we can be restored to God who is the source of all happiness. Um, Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That is a holy heart. That's a purified heart. That's a heart that wants things of heaven. That's a heart that has a longing for its home that is with the Lord. Um, So how should we respond? Really practically speaking, number one, I would just say don't compromise on what God defines as happiness. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, the love chapter says that love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Sin, here's the truth, sin robs people in any form. It robs people of happiness because it robs them of God. It creates separation between a person and their true source of happiness, which is God himself. Number two, practically speaking, is use logic. Just because something makes a person feel happy or just because it makes them feel right or good, it doesn't mean that that thing is justifiable. This is an issue of accountability. Um, We live in a world that's very relativistic. What's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. We live in a world that's very individualistic. Um, I'm about my happiness, my self-preservation, what's going to give me the most sense of fulfillment. And we live in a world where if you tell somebody that they can't do something that they feel like will achieve those ends for them, you are a horrible person. You do not love that person. You are not for that person. And that's simply not true. The Christian worldview just says that we are accountable to a maker. We're accountable to a God. He's given us a path to happiness. He's given us a path toward holiness. Um, We need to respond to that. And if we have a different worldview than someone else, then perhaps that's the first place that we need to begin reasoning with that person. Number three, finally, is just be compassionate. Um, I feel like there's no shortage of need to say a couple of verses out loud to Christians today. Colossians 3.12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and this one's the hardest, amen, patience, patience. 
The second one is Proverbs 15.1. Here's some wisdom. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's my answer. That's good, Glenn. Justin, this one's for you. How does God see those who harm themselves or take their life? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say just right away, God sees those people and he loves them. He has so much compassion for them. I think there's a lot of us who may see in society the people who maybe harm themselves, be it cutting or, you know, of any kind of self-harm in that nature. Um, I think we have the tendency and the temptation to believe they're kind of the, the unclean, like the, the lepers of society back in the Old Covenant. Um, we get intimidated, I think, because we don't know what to say or to do about it. Um, but look how Jesus treated the unclean of the day. Look how Jesus approached the lepers and the people who would have been outcast or not known what to do with. Uh, Jesus was most drawn to those kind of people. Uh, he was the one who always led out with compassion and love and kindness. And I think I just want to show us how much God values life. He, he values people. That's, that's what he came to. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. And so we look at 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And in order for us to not perish, we know John three sixteen that for God so loved the world, for God so loved those who would harm themselves or even commit suicide, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I think underneath this question, I may... There may be the wrestle of the kind of the age-old question within church tradition. Is suicide the unforgivable sin? And I'd say from a strictly biblical view, we do not see that anywhere. We do not see that suicide is the unforgivable sin. We see that the only unforgivable sin is the sin that has not come under the blood of Jesus. Those who have not repented and turned from sin, those who have not trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior to run their life and save their life, that is the only person who would die without hope. So someone who would, if we just are being, for calling it for what it is, suicide is self-murder. And we know that murder can be forgiven. We know that any murderer, would Jesus hung on the cross with criminals, and in their dying breath, Jesus said, today, truly I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. And so we see so much hope, and that's what I want to leave off with, is that those who self-harm, those who may even be contemplating suicide, those who may have attempted suicide, those who have maybe actually gone through and committed suicide, if they were in Christ, if they had truly bowed their knee and received forgiveness through the sacrificial, substitutionary blood of Jesus on the cross, we have no reason to believe that they are not with Jesus right now. And that's what I'd have to say about that. We see that uh, in 1 Peter 2.24. And this is where, if we look at kind of the reasons for why people may even be doing this in the first place. Uh, there's a plethora of reasons that are not always mutually exclusive. It, it could be because people want to feel control. That maybe something has happened in their life or in their past where they feel like they have no control. And so this one way is to try to feel that. It may be done just to try to feel something in general, that they, they are just numb to the world. Their heart is so hardened. Uh, they may feel anger. They may feel self-hatred. There's so many reasons why people may be feeling this and might, may be attempting this, even right now in the room. And I want to leave you with hope. That First Peter 2.24 says, Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness and I love this. By his wounds, you have been healed. Amen. That means that any wound, whether physical, emotional, spiritual, Jesus says, I can take that on myself because I did at the cross. That you can cast your cares upon me and I would gladly take them. And in return, in exchange, you get righteousness. You get life. You get freedom. You get hope. You get healing in every nature of the word. And so that's the hope that I want to give you. That's the hope that Jesus offers. And if you're in that, uh, I would actually love to talk with you. Um, that we have a care team that would love to meet with you. Um, on the website, we have a care request form. If you're currently experiencing this or the wounds of someone who is, uh, reach out, first of all, um, with suicide hotline, things like that nature. Um, but then if it's something maybe lesser, I guess if you'd say, or maybe a gray area, uh, we as the pastors and I especially would love to come and talk to you. Amen. That's good, Justin. 
I'm going to take one live from the website, fellas. Uh, let's see. Uh, Roy, are you going to wash your fanny pack? Seriously? <laughs> I have your name on this one. We'll get to a serious one. Let's get back. You know what? Glenn, take this one. Here's this. Is the rapture true? If so, when does it happen? Okay, if you are able, real quick in the room, just if you're able, if you can't, that's fine. Stand up. Seriously. Stand up. Stretch just a little bit. Because this ain't a short answer, okay? <laughs> you can sit back down. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to give credit where it's due. Uh, I did some grad studies in 2015, and there's a couple authors, Bruce Ware and um, Millard Erickson, who have been really helpful uh, to me through the years in understanding uh, eschatology, which is the study of the end times or the last things. So um, here's the key text where the question of the rapture, which we're going to get to really saying what that is. I would expect there might be some people in the room who are like, I don't even really know what that is. So uh, here it is, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read to you 13 to 17. It says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself, here it is, will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, first the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Key verse right here. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So the word rapture, you don't see that in, in your English Bible. We get it from the Latin translation of that last verse there, caught up. Um, I'm not sure how to say the Latin version of it, like raptura or something. But that's where we get rapture from. And unfortunately, it's not, Usher's hit song, Caught Up, does not have anything to do with the rapture. Uh, I wish it did. But the rapture is a subject within the study of the end times. And it's basically how, here's the study of the end times. How is God going to bring closure to the age that we're in? and establish his kingdom and the new heavens and the new earth forever. What's going to happen? In what order are those events going to take place? Now, there is so much that could be said here. Uh, some of you in the room are going to want me to say something. I'm probably not going to say it. Uh, there's just so many things that we could, we could do. So I want to try to just brief us in response to the question, which is, is it true? And if so, uh, when does it happen? What scripture teaches us is that there will be a great tribulation, before Jesus' second coming, in which, on the planet, um, deception will rise, God's discipline will increase, his wrath will be poured out on the world, um, hatred and persecution will come. The question of the rapture has to do with whether believers will be present or absent during those seven years. So let's consider a few views, okay? The first view, there's really three popular ones, the first view is pre-tribulational Rapture. This is popularized by the Left Behind books and movies. Anybody seen those? Anybody familiar? Got some hands in the room. Um, this view is that the church, which is made up of all true believers in Christ, is going to be taken up or raptured just prior to that seven-year tribulation period. And this time of tribulation is seen as unique in its intensity, its severity. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation perhaps to distinguish it from all other kinds of persecutions or trials or tribulations uh, that the church goes through. And the church is going to escape it. Not going to be present for any of it. Christ's second coming then is in two stages. Um, the first, when Jesus comes for the church and meets the church in the air, caught up with him in the air. The second, when Christ comes back after the tribulation with the church to set up his millennial kingdom. Now, the millennium is a whole other conversation. Uh, can't wait for this time next year for someone to ask a question 
on that. You'll have to wait a year. Um, Here's the thing. The, 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 a big purpose of the tribulation in this view is to save the Jewish people and, and prepare for the restoration of Israel. And within pre-tribulation rapture, there are three resurrections that happen. The first is the resurrection of the, the believers who are dead to meet the Lord in the air prior to the tribulation. The second is the resurrection of the martyred saints who died during the tribulation. We get that from Revelation chapter 20. I just want to show you Biblical text. Uh, Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So you have a resurrection of the righteous dead to meet the Lord in the air. You have the resurrection of all the people who uh, became believers, were martyred during the tribulation. Then number three, you have the resurrection of all unbelievers at the end of the millennial kingdom, which is the next verse, Revelation 25. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So two Main judgments are seen within this view. The first is the judgment of believers taking place at the judgment seat of Christ. We get that from Revelation chapter 19 and 2 Corinthians 5. The second is the great white throne judgment of all the unsaved at the end of the millennium from the next chapter, Revelation 20. I'll read that to you just so you can see it. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So, a few things that are in support of this pre-tribulation view. And by the way, this is by far the longest one. The other two are a lot shorter. Um, A few things. Number one is the assertion that all of the judgments that we read about in the book of Revelation that have to do with God's wrath, they describe divine judgment Not that's just like some more tribulations, but a person in this camp would argue that they describe judgment of enormous proportions. So much so that there's no way that God would allow his people to endure that. The second thing is a need for an interval between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ, the the return of Christ. Um, Proponents of this would say that the church needs to be purified before Christ comes, and that's what happens during the, the first judgment uh, and the first resurrection. Here's the last thing that I would say, uh, just to bring it, land the plane, that is one of the biggest arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture. And that is that over and over again, we are told in Scripture to be ready, be on the alert, be watchful for the coming of Christ. And a, a pre-trib argument would say that those only make sense if there's nothing that needs to be fulfilled still prophetically um, in a time of tribulation there's nothing that needs to be fulfilled that stands between right now and Jesus coming so that's the pre-tribulation view some much shorter ones number two is the the mid-tribulation or the pre-wrath view This is a view that the church will be present for and go through the first half, about three and a half years of the tribulation, which is seen as more natural tribulations and trials, but will be raptured out at the halfway point um, and so be absent for the latter three and a half years, which is just prior to the outpouring of God's wrath. There's a difference between tribulation and wrath in this view, and support is found in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's giving his discourse on the Mount of Olives. And they had asked him to explain his return, explain to us the end of the world. And Jesus says a lot. He says a lot about false prophets, wars, famines, natural disasters, Christian persecution and martyrdom, sin becoming rampant, um, and interesting love becoming cold and, and dormant and absent in our world. 
the key assertion in this view is that Jesus makes a transition in verse 21. Again, I want to just read it to you. This is Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 29. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet. And they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. After the anguish of those days, that line in verse 29 indicates in this view a shift from the natural forms of tribulation of the first half to the second half, which is really the divine wrath of God being poured out. And several verses of scripture, this is key to this whole debate. Several verses of scripture tell us that God has um, promised us that we will not experience his wrath for those who are in Christ. I'll give you a few. Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then a huge one, Revelation 3.10. Probably the most pointed verse of debate in the Bible on this stuff. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. To try those who dwell on the earth. So, God will remove the church from the earth just prior to the outpouring of his wrath. Now the third view. The third view is the post-tribulational view. Um, many of you are like, I did not sign up for seminary. This is just a local church. Like, why are we? So bear with me here, okay? You did ask. That's your fault. We actually have more than one person ask, okay? So this is on you, not us. The church, the church in the post-tribulational view, the church will go through the tribulation rather than being raptured out before or in the middle of the tribulation. So in this view, the rapture of the church and the resurrection of all dead saints occur in the same unitary singular event. Does that make sense? There is no rapture, you know, kind of, I hate to say it, but kind of a yo-yo where Jesus comes down, gets people, goes back up, seven years later, you know, comes back. It, this, the, the argument is that it all happens in one fell swoop. The, the, the people of God are, are caught up with him in, in the clouds. He comes for his saints, and then immediately he establishes his kingdom. Saints rule with him. Um, one of the things that lies underneath this view generally is that post-tribulationists would see the church as having replaced national Israel as the covenant people of God. There's a whole system of theology behind a pre-tribulational rapture that would say that there is a clear distinction uh, throughout Scripture between the church, which includes the, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel and God's covenant. God's covenants are different with the people of Israel and with the church, us Gentiles today. The support for the post-tribulational view, and then I'm done, is this. And, and they're kind of compelling. Uh, the church is never told that it is to escape tribulation. The Greek word phlipsis which is used for tribulation, is used 55 times in the New Testament. 47 of those relate to tribulation that is to be endured by the saints. That same word is used in what Jesus was saying in Matthew 24 of the great tribulation. Another thing in support of this view is that 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, the text we started with, it describes the church meeting the Lord in the air, but it does not say in any way that the Lord takes the church on up to heaven for three and a half or seven years. Just on its surface, it doesn't say that. Um, through Revelation 6 through 18, the people of God are thought to be present in the way that you read those passages. Um, and so there's no reason to exclude the church from tribulation passages. And then finally, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is writing to an audience who thinks that they are enduring the day of the Lord or the time of the great tribulation. And they would have to have believed um, in a pre-trib rapture uh, 
they wouldn't have believed that if they believed in a pre-tribulation rapture, to think that they were experiencing the tribulation and the, the day of the Lord. And Paul only tells them that their current persecution is not the day of the Lord, not the tribulation, just that they will be spared from it. So in conclusion, let me just clear the lines here. City Light Bennington does not have a dogmatic view on the rapture. Uh, There is no need to divide fellowship, I believe, over a subject like this. There are actually honest, thorough, biblical emphases that give compelling cases for each of those views, even if your pastors might personally, you know, lean toward one or the other. Here is where we all ought to align and where the church is dogmatic. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. Living our lives in light of that changes everything. Jesus is coming back, and with his coming will come judgment, will come wrath, will come the driving out of Satan and sin and death forever. And we believe wholeheartedly that this is imminent. Nothing is going to stop this from happening. It is coming, period. That is a belief that we are are dogmatic on, is that the second coming of Jesus uh, is coming. And here's the thing. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. I had to save this for the last. This is the verse right after everything we read at the top of my answer. The next verse, Paul says in closing, as he's talking about Jesus' second coming, encourage or strengthen or comfort one another with these words. So why would he go to all that length to share that? So that we could get exhausted debating all of the ways it's going to happen rather than I'm so encouraged, I'm comforted, I'm strengthened right now for today because Jesus is coming again. And if you belong to Christ, we have full assurance that the story ends really, really well for us. So a recommended resource for you uh, is called A Basic Guide to Eschatology making sense of the millennium it's by millard erickson would highly recommend that Woo! that's good that's good glenn uh i'm on the facebook live messenger app right now checking out some live comments <laughs> one is thoroughly detailed answered applause emoji but answer this what we're all thinking when's your next haircut bro <laughs> you don't have to answer that oh i will okay Here's the answer, whenever I want it to be. There Thank we you. go. There we go. You guys are so harsh with us. Fanny pack, haircut. Justin, I can't wait to see what they say about you. Nothing speaking wrong. of Justin. No complaints about Justin. Speaking of Justin, I love how the light just came through when we spoke Justin's name. It's all bright in here now. Question number seven, Justin, this one's for you. How can a true Christ follower be deceived? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we have to wrestle with the already but not yet type uh, mentality when it comes to Christianity. Um, The idea that we are saved and yet scripture says we are being saved. We had referenced that scripture earlier. Um, So the idea of that is as you are being saved, God is sustaining but he's also sanctifying. Meaning sanctification simply means to be set apart. Um, So as we are set apart, all of us, our, our thought life, our minds, our hearts, our emotions, our actions, our, or just everything is being continually more and more set apart for God to use, work through, uh, and offer his praise and worship. So as we go through that as Christians, uh, one of the biggest things, as I reference, is the mind. We see um, kind of a combination, actually, of head, heart, hands. We, we talk about that kind of an even application uh, we'll start with the heart because Jeremiah 17, 9, you referenced, um, says that the heart is deceitful above all things, talking about deceit here, um, and desperately sick who can understand it. So the idea that many times we are deceived, it's, it's not always necessarily demonic influence, which can be, and I can address some of that later, but um, primarily we see throughout Scripture that we're deceived because of our hearts. Um, there's a, a large mentality, even um, if you look at I don't want to reference something super dark, but the Church of Satan, their biggest thing is literally do what you want. Follow your heart. And you hear that in culture all the time. Follow your heart. Follow your dreams. Just do what you want, Um, which is completely antithetical to Scripture, which says don't do what you want because if you do, you're going to be deceived. You're going to fall into desperate sickness. Um, And so 
looking at the heart, but that's paired also with the mind. And here's the beauty of the gospel, that the gospel renews and uh, gives us everything new. And specifically, the mind is so powerful. As you look at Romans 12, 2, uh, look at the words of Paul. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not just follow your heart, as everyone else says, but be transformed by the renewal of what? Your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So looking at that, the way that we kind of uh, battle the heart's deceitful desires is actually with the renewed mind. The renewed mind is that day by day as we're continually testing everything that Scripture shows us, that God's revealed will for our lives is revealed and we are actually having our minds enveloped and wrapped up in and meditating and thinking on those things uh, that it actually begins to change us. It actually begins to give us a standard of holy living that says, no, I don't have to just follow my heart. I actually get to think about what I'm thinking about and actually do that instead. And that's the renewed mind, and it's only by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. No one can just read the Bible and just follow it perfectly. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit through the grace of God that is, flows through the cross. Um, so that's addressing kind of the heart and the head, but I also want to show us that James 1.22 talks about the hands. He says, but be doers of the word and not only hearers, only deceiving yourselves, meaning that if you think about these things, but as soon as you get done thinking about it, you forget about them. Um, James says it's like looking at yourself in the mirror and instantly forgetting what you look like, and that's what it's like to be uh, basically hearers of God's word and not doers. So we can deceive ourselves by not doing the very things that we're thinking about, if that makes sense. So it all kind of culminates into we can be led astray by our hearts, by the cravings, the appetite of our flesh that wants to do things that are against God's will and word. But rather we can take those thoughts captive and be renewed in our minds to think about his will and then not just think about them, but do them, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I also do want to address that um, the deception is not always of the deceitful heart. I had mentioned earlier, there is a real enemy. There is real demonization that happens, even for Christians. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to see some scary movie where it's possession. It just literally means that we can be altered in our thought life, that the devil would come to, of course, attack the very thing that God says needs to be renewed, which is our mind. Uh, the Satan uh, comes in 2 Corinthians 10, th 3 through 6. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Um, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. If you find yourself walking in disobedience, if you find yourself struggling time and time again with sin, it's probably not just because uh, you're just having all these strong feelings. If you would trace it back those strong feelings, those cravings, those feelings of feeling like, well, I can never get out of this cyclical sin, it's most likely if you would trace back because your thinking is in a cyclical pattern that is incorrect. And, and God is saying, if you would renew your mind, if you would think about the right things, things that are pure, lovely, worthy of praise, I'll watch as your life begins to follow that. That's good, Justin. You got a fan? Fan this boy down. He's on fire right now. I'm um, going back to the messenger app, y'all, to hear from the congregation. The question for you, Justin, is what, do the you... The messenger app? I just, does anyone, is that like a thing? We'll talk after. Okay. So the question for you, Justin, is do you only shop at Abercrombie <laughs> or American Eagle? You're not going to answer that. That do, sounds good. Do you hate Old Navy... Gap. Baby Gap. <laughs> Target. The next question is, can you wear a large shirt instead of mediums? Okay. All right, last one. Last one today. Last one this morning. Last one this morning. Glenn, this one's for you. What are the details of life after death? What are the details of life after death? So, um, what a question. Can we just stop real quick and think about that question? As Christians, we have hope for life after death. Do we take that for granted? What are the details of that? Um, my goodness, I, I think immediately of Paul's words where he says, no, 
um, mind can know, um, no ear has heard, um, no heart or mind can comprehend um, what God has prepared for those who love him. So in some sense, we are left with a lot of mystery about the details of life after death. But I will leave us with some things we can infer from Scripture. Um, this gets us into territory that is about the, the, the intermediate state is the term that's used, or, or even the intermediate or present heaven. So there's coming a resurrection, y'all, uh, of, of everyone, um, for the just, it will be to eternal bliss. For those who have not trusted in Jesus, it will be to eternal damnation. What happens then to people right now today who pass away? Where do they go if the new heavens and the new earth has not yet been established? So I'll, I'll keep it brief. Number one, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So one thing we can hold to in Scripture uh, Philippians 1.23, Paul even uses the language, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 says, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I think of the text you mentioned earlier, Jesus with the thief on the cross. He looks at him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. There's something really, really significant about that. Um, so what scripture teaches us is that while the, the body may be buried, decomposed, cremated, whatever, the soul immediately goes to be in the presence of the Lord and God can rejoin those at the resurrection. He will give us uh, regenerated, renewed, restored bodies uh, that are ours. Um, and, and in that intermediate state, you know, we, we would not say that we believe in uh, some form of purgatory. Uh, we don't find biblical evidence for that. Uh, we would also not say that we believe in some kind of soul sleep where a person dies today and they're just in the black, unconscious, until the day that they are resurrected because the, the Scripture just doesn't give evidence to that. Um, what I do want to stress in, in closing is that in Daniel 12, 2, says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus in Matthew 25, a couple of times, the first in verse 41 says, you know, to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then just five verses later, again, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If you are a Christian this morning and you are asking the question, what are the details of life after death? The answer is drastically different for that person than it is for someone who has not bowed their knee to Jesus. I would say to you, I would appeal to you, if Jesus is coming again, you want to belong to him and not be an enemy to him. Um, we could talk a lot about that. My appeal would be what Jesus says in John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. We will all live forever in some sense. And it will either be against God or it will be with God in the new heavens and the new earth. In Revelation chapter 21, this is what we all have to look forward to if we put our faith in Jesus. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne say, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Church, did you know that there's a reality of no mores that's coming? That's how I've heard it phrased. It's just there's coming a reality for the Christian. It's a reality of the no mores. There will be no more tears. There will be no more death, no more sorrowing, sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All these things are gone forever. Behold, God makes all things new. This is the hope reserved for us who trust in Jesus. So if you do not trust in Jesus, 
May salvation be today for you. May you believe that he can forgive you of your sin. He can invite you into relationship with him and he can hold you and keep you and preserve you for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. Rich, go ahead. Let's stand together in closing. If you have any questions, we'll be back there in the Get Connected table in that corner over there. We want to say thank you for sending in all of the questions. Can we give it up for the pastors for fielding those? Every week we finish with a benediction, and it comes from a Moravian missions. They were uh, born again missionaries that lived long ago in Europe, and they would sell themselves into slavery so that they could witness to those who were being enslaved. And as they would uh, be shipped away, they would wave across as they would separate from boat to land, and they would say, now would the lamb who was slain receive the reward for his suffering? So we have a benediction right here that we say every week. I wanted to give historical context because we're connecting to some pretty God-filled missionaries from back in the day. And that's the attitude we want to have as spirit-filled and led people who are centered on the truth of Jesus. Real quick before we say this together, because we'll say it all together in unison is what I'm asking. Uh, Come back next week. We're starting our book series through the whole book of Genesis. We're back in the book of the Bible. You can be excited about that. We are, and we're going to talk about creation and God's historical account of creation next week and move forward. Now, let's say this together. Now, as we follow the Spirit's leading this week, may Jesus receive the reward for his suffering. Amen, church. Be blessed.